You know, on my planet, a sock on the door means somebody's <laughs> Welcome back, Screen Crush. I'm Ryan Airy, and these are all of the Easter eggs, references, and little things that you might have missed in Season 2, Episode 6 of... A little later, I'm going to have Colton Ogburn, the man who's eternally trapped on our television but doesn't know it, so please don't tell him. Tune in and help us host this breakdown. Person, what smells so good? Dude, I'll tell you later. We're doing a video right now. Sorry. So, we pick up with the Lizard League's brutal attack on the Guardians of the Globe, who remained on Earth while the others went to space to stop the Sequid invasion. In the Guardians' battle with the Sequids, we got to see Shapesmith have some serious character development and prove himself to be worthy of having a place on the team. And he personally redeemed himself for me after I was a little peeved at him for replacing Russ Stevenson to begin with. Next, we get this brief tension between Invincible and Immortal, mirroring the tension between Immortal and Omni-Man and reminding us of Immortal's lack of trust in Mark. This scene also teased the repressed anger and mental break we'd see Immortal have later in the episode when he finds out about the death of Duplicate, all foreshadowing his eventual retirement. Back on Earth, we learned that not only did Rex survive his shot to the head, but Shrinking Ray also survived this. <laughs> And guys, I've always found Rex a little annoying, but that's no disrespect to the character. He's stylistically designed to be that way. It's stylistically designed to be that way, and you can't undo that, but we can diminish the effects of it. But this episode really elevated his character from being the class clown to an actual respectable hero, just like they did with Shapesmith in the previous scene. Speaking of, after defeating the Sequids, the Martians say they're going to execute Shapesmith. Me? What kind of punishment? Death. The Star Wars nerd in me couldn't help but to think back to the scene of the Phantom Menace when the Gungans were going to punish Jar Jar. He seemed to be punished. But Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan saved him. But I loved how, in this series, we saw no attempt at negotiations, and it just immediately cuts to the Guardians fleeing the Martian ship with Shapesmith. Person, you gotta tell me, what smells so good? Is it cookies? No, it's not cookies. It's me. You're wearing cookies? Oh no, that's just a waste of cookies. No, I'm not wearing cookies, I'm wearing cologne. This is gold by Commodity. It's a high-end fragrance, but I was able to get it for just over $7 through Scentbird, the sponsor of this video. Guys, Scentbird is a great service for a guy like me because I want to smell good. I don't want to be one of those fancy guys who always smells nice, but I really have no idea what makes for a good cologne. And I also don't want to go dropping a lot of money on a pricey bottle. You see, Scentbird is a fragrance subscription service that lets you skip any month with no penalties. And if you are new to wearing cologne, it is a great way to start. So to educate you about the cologne, they send along a descriptive card that explains the ingredients and the proper occasion to wear that particular fragrance. This month, my favorite was Cobalt Patchouli and Cedar by Joe Loves. It's a natural fragrance that contains grapefruit, patchouli, cedarwood, and geranium. Ah, yes. And I'm also detecting an understated intensity, like people notice when you walk into a room, but they do not know why. Thanks, Doug. Now, actually, these samples are eight times bigger than a normal sample size you would get at a store. You can choose a designer fragrance every month for just $17. You get a 30-day supply, and you get to pick what you want to receive, so there are never any surprises. This is a great way to learn about cologne, find what you like, without spending hundreds of dollars for a bottle. See, guys, a dash of cologne has now become an important part of my morning routine. A shower, get spruced up, and then the finishing touch is just a little spray of cologne. So, if you want to give Scentbird a try, click this QR code and use our code SCREEN55 OFF and click the link in the description to get 55% off. That's just over $7 for your first month available in the USA and Canada. Thanks again to Scentbird for sponsoring this video and check out our sample links below. You really do smell great. Thanks buddy, high five. Now, throughout this episode, we got very subtle hints at romantic tension between Mark and Eve. It's important to point out that around the same time in the comics, Mark and Eve are together. But simultaneously to Mark and Eve's romantic tension, we have the resurgence of a spark between Rex and Eve. Now, I really enjoyed seeing Invincible earn Immortal's respect. There was always a bit of an unspoken rivalry between Immortal and Omni-Man, even before Omni-Man slaughtered the original Guardians of the Globe. So, it's only natural for Immortal to be wary of accepting another Viltrumite and the son of Omni-Man into the fold. Now, as we discussed in the previous this episode, Mark's new purple baby brother being half Thraxen makes him grow at an alarming rate. Thraxen's experienced an entire lifetime in less than one human year. Oliver being born half Viltrumite slows down that process, but he still ages pretty quickly. And speaking of Oliver, I've been calling him by that name all season because we know it from the comics. But it actually wasn't until this episode that we saw him get his name in the series. Good job, Oliver. Oliver? In the first half of this season, Andressa said that on Thraxa, their children choose their own name. And I mean, that makes sense considering they've probably aged enough in a week or two to make that decision for themselves. But with Oliver, he ages at half the rate of a traditional Thraxan. So I have to agree with Debbie. Well, he needed an actual name besides Nolan's alien baby.
So Debbie named Oliver after her father, not to be confused with Mark and Oliver's other grandfather on their dad's side, Emperor Argal. In this morgue, we can see the many bodies of Duplicate following her battle with Komodo Dragon. And this scene got me to thinking, what do they usually do with Kate's other bodies? We've seen her duplicates get killed before, but following the death of her true self, we see her body plus all the duplicates stacked up in the morgue. And speaking of Kate's death, Immortal is taking it rough. Remember, in the first half of this season, we saw the beginnings of a romantic relationship between the two. You and I were never a thing. Immortal and I are. In the comics, Duplicate's power is the result of a curse, as we heard Immortal mention at her funeral. Though her powers came from a family curse, she believed they were a gift. The curse goes as follows. The seventh generation after Cha's seventh grandchild would be burdened with a family too large to care for. But over the years, Duplicate eventually learns to control her power and use it for her advantage. And look, the Invincible series has been pretty loyal to the comics, so if you don't want spoilers, skip ahead about 20 seconds. We'll mark it in the chapters below. You still here? Great. Colton, take it away. In the comics, we see Duplicate die, just like in the series, but it turns out that this wasn't the only remaining duplicate of Duplicate. So, to those of you left distraught, by her gruesome fate, do not worry, she will be back. I'll be back. When Immortal says, Why do I feel this way, Marcus? This mirrors what Omni Man said to Mark about the Thraxans in the mid season finale. Why? Why do I care about them? This entire series is about godlike beings living amongst man, and the paths that different characters like Omni-Man and Invincible take when in possession of that power. This season especially is diving into the paths the characters take by bringing in the multiverse angle of it all. So getting to see Immortal, a character who literally can't die, struggling with the loss of someone he loved, it's yet another perspective on the life of a god living amongst men. When Mark and Amber meet for coffee, we can see what looks like two little broken hearts floating at the top of their drinks, foreshadowing their rocky relationship and eventual breakup. And while Mark and Amber's relationship struggles may be amplified by the fact that Mark is a superhero, this is really just an exaggerated take on real life. Mark and Amber growing apart is perfectly normal for young love. In college, you do a lot of growing up and you're quite literally finding your path in life. And the path you've shared with the people you're close to can easily diverge, especially when you're a superhero. And this once again brings us back to the series overall theme of choice and the path in life one takes. And how that all can connect to the multiverse. So next we learn that Debbie actually has to chew Oliver's food for him like a mother bird because Oliver doesn't have the necessary enzymes. This is meant to symbolize how Debbie has taken taken Oliver under her wing and will protect and guide him as a mother, the same way she did Mark. And it's also common with birds to mother an egg found in their nest, even if it's not their own egg. Which is what we're seeing happening here with Debbie and Oliver. Oliver may not be Debbie's son, but he is the brother of her son and she is treating Oliver like he is her own. Now, Omni-Man may have been the one to physically teach Mark how to fly, but we have to keep in mind that it was really Debbie who taught Mark what to fly for for, so to speak. She instilled in him the values of great power coming with great responsibility. Hey, that's a Spider-Man line. Actually, I think it's a Madam Web line. Has to do with Spider-Man, I think. Anyway, next we get the return of Rick Sheridan. Rick, how are you feeling? Hi, Mark. Um, I, I guess I'm fine. Back in season one, we saw Rick get turned into a cyborg by D.A. Sinclair. Rick was then taken by Cecil. When Mark says, Wow, Rick looks exactly the same. It's clear by Donald's reaction that Rick, just like Donald, has been given a synthetic cyborg body. Next, we meet April Hausman, Oliver's tutor from the comics. Next, we see Cecil attempt to recruit Adam Eve back into the Guardians of the Globe. Ready to join the team? You're old friends with half of them anyway. You see, back in season one, when Eve caught Rex cheating on her with Duplicate, Eve decided that it was time for her to leave the team and venture out on her own. I'll be better. I, I promise. Good luck with the new team, Rex. But with Eve and Rex seeming to have mended those old wounds, perhaps Eve will soon be ready to rejoin the team in an official capacity. Next, we get the return of Mark Hamill's Art Rosenbaum. I told you it's gonna be another four hours. Okay, so look, before we go any further, there are some costumes and glass cases here at Art's facility. I searched everywhere trying to figure out who these might belong to, but I had no luck. So if you have any idea who these costumes might be a reference 
favorites to, let me know down in the comments below or at me on Twitter, and we'll be sure to shout you out in our next breakdown. So guys, while Mark Hamill will forever be Luke Skywalker, it's important to remember that he's had a very successful voice acting career. So anytime I get to hear the voice of the Joker himself, it's a real treat. <laughs> Now, I love this conversation between Mark and Art because it brings us back to the feeling Mark was having in this season's premiere, a fear that he'll become just like his father and abandon the ones he loves. Mark feels guilty for being gone so long, even though he's out there doing heroic things. Because I'm doing exactly to her what my dad did to me and my mom. So in the mid-season finale, we saw Nolan tell Mark to read his books, and here we see Art give Mark a box of some of his dad's works. Inside this box is the key to bringing down the Viltrum Empire. The first book is The Man with the Invincible Gun, the invincible gun being the Infinity Ray. It was said to emit an unstoppable energy wave that destroyed anything in its path. As we'll later learn from Alan the Alien, these books are based on real people out there in the universe. The Man with the Invincible Gun is based on Space Racer, and the blasts from his sidearm are lethal to Viltrumites. The gun also behaves a lot like Thor's hammer, Mjolnir. If the gun is separated from Space Racer, it will return to his hand before anyone else can use it. Now, the next book was Savage Planet, Savage Beasts. This book tells us about Raftars. I'm hauling Raftars. Sorry, I mean Rock. Ragnars, alien creatures from a planet with a very dense gravity, resulting in them being remarkably strong. They first appeared in Invincible number 35 way back in 2006. The Ragnars are able to rip Viltrumites to shreds and they will prove to be a worthy ally to the Coalition of Planets. So the Viltrumites were so threatened by these creatures that they blocked out their planet's sun, causing the planet to freeze. In the comics, we see Omni-Man and Alan the Alien travel back to this planet in hopes of using these creatures to take on the Empire. After the destruction of the Viltrumite disc blocking their sun, the Ragnars began to thaw and they attacked Omni-Man and Alan. Long story short, those beasts cannot be tamed. But later on in the comics, and and hopefully in the TV series, we see some Ragnars rip apart some Viltrumites. Now, some other books we saw were Lost Inside the Chasm of Oblivion and Hate Tribes on the Planet Wreck. So following Alan's fight with the Viltrumites earlier this season, if you could even call it a fight, I got my ass kicked is what? He was put on life support. Thaddeus, leader of the Coalition of Planets and former Viltrumite, pulled the plug on Alan. Forgive me, Alan. But as we learned in the previous episode, this was in hopes that Alan would recover bigger and stronger than before. You're a lot bigger than the last time I saw you. When Alan gets to Earth to bring Invincible back to Thaddeus, we see him have a run-in with Immortal, just like he has with Omni-Man and Invincible the past times that he's come to Earth. Hey, you're early. You shaved your mustache. When Immortal confronts Alan, we can see that he's out for blood simply because of his rage following the death of Duplicate. Luckily, Invincible shows up before things get messy. And guys, I love the design flaw bit in Alan's inhibitor chip. My thing only works between me and someone else, not between two other someone else's. When Alan and Mark go back to Mark's dorm, we see Alan sit on Mark's bed and break it, just like in the comics. When the two discuss the whereabouts of Omni-Man, Alan mentions a Viltrumite prison. For rumors of a Viltrumite prison somewhere in space, maybe they took him there. And that is exactly where we see Nolan being held by General Krieg at the end of this episode. Remember, we first met General Krieg in the mid-season finale when he and the Viltrumites took Nolan from Thraxa. Krieg then instructed Mark to take Earth or they would be back and kill a lot of humans. And look, can I just say that Mark seems a little, I don't know, unbothered by the fact that a Viltrumite general told him they would be coming to Earth to kill a bunch of people and take over. You think Mark would have shown back up on Earth running up to Cecil like Loki did Mobius in the season one finale. We need to prepare. It also seems like Mark is in a bit of denial, which I guess is understandable. I mean, he does have a lot going on. As if his relationship struggles with Amber, the attack on the Guardians by the Lizard League, a little brother to raise, and an impending Viltrumite takeover of Earth wasn't enough, we learned that a freaking Sequid made it back to Earth. And if that wasn't enough, we've also got the multiverse trap 
traveling supervillain Angstrom Levy determined to destroy Invincible. I'm gonna catch ya, dispatch ya. In the final scene of this episode, we see Angstrom traveling through different realities, one of which is a zombie reality, perhaps a wink and a nod to another multiversal animated series, Marvel's What If. When Angstrom arrives at his destination, he says, Ah, uh, it is good to be home. And on a billboard, we can see what looks like Omni-Man as well as a whoosh of wind depicting a hero flying. Now, as we learned in the first half of this season, in most realities, Omni-Man and Invincible team up to take over Earth. But one thing to pay close attention to is that this seems to be a version of Times Square in New York City. In the first episode of this season, we see Invincible speaking on a large screen just like the one we saw here. And a variant of Angstrom Levy is seen in the destroyed city as Invincible speaks to the people of Earth. This variant of Angstrom is working with the surviving members of the Guardians of the Globe who are resisting Viltrumite rule. Now, when Invincible goes to kill Angstrom to make an example of those who dare join the resistance, we see him fall through a portal. We, of course, later find out that he was one of the many variants recruited by our current Angstrom Levy for his mind-merging device. Now, I bring all of this up and I bring up Times Square because in Invincible issue 16, we see a very similar shot of Times Square. In the comic panel, we see Invincible giving the same speech that we mentioned from that episode. And a few pages later, we see Angstrom portaled away by his variant self before being killed by Invincible, very similar to what happened in the season premiere. Now, I tell you all this because I think it's clear that in this final scene, Angstrom has traveled to a reality where Omni-Man and Invincible have succeeded in building a Viltrumite utopia on Earth. And this is likely the same universe we can see in the first scene of this season, and you can even tell by some of the sleek architecture that the Viltrumites have likely influenced the resurrection of the city following their takeover. Now, I think you're right on the money because in the comics, Angstrom recruits variants of Invincible from across the multiverse to help him kill the Invincible who destroyed his multiversal mind merging device. And I think that's exactly what Angstrom is doing here. He's recruiting another Invincible to help take down the one and only Mark Grayson who stood up to Viltrumite rule. Our Mark Grayson. Well, guys, those are all the Easter eggs that we caught in this episode. Big shout out to Colton who wrote this video. You can find his socials below and you can let us know what you thought down in the comments or at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe, smash that bell for alerts. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.